It is good to be worshiping with you today. Thank you very much for those remarks, Lisa. And uh, a special thank you to Howard Good for inviting me to share my message with you, MEDA members and supporters. It is truly an honor. To my fellow US citizens, though you are soon to leave, uh, it does give me great pleasure to welcome you to Ontario, Canada, the great white north. And I am happy to report that it is more great than it is white. And that's important to a former Floridian. I am especially delighted to share the stage with Grable Choir students and our eminent professor of music, Dr. Leonard Entz. Dr. Entz is in his 36th year as professor of music at Conrad Grable, and he will be retiring at the end of this year. So I see services like this one as the beginning of a long and rich farewell tour. Len is a world-renowned composer, and that's not an exaggeration, and has had just a delightful, rich career with three choirs. So thank you, Len, and students for coming with me this morning. This morning, my message is entitled From Career Risks to Life Enriching Returns, Inspiring Stories for the 4G Crowd. It could be also subtitled Drop Your Nets and Follow Me, Embracing Counterculture Calls to Serve the Church. Here's why. I've always wondered about the day Jesus walks up to four small businessmen in the fishing industry Simon Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and says, drop your nets and follow me. I've wondered about it in two ways. First, why did Jesus choose these fellows as disciples? They were not religious leaders. They were fishermen. And you know, Jesus doesn't say to them, say, guys, after your work on Friday, would you volunteer on the weekend in traveling around with me in Judea, sharing the good news? No. He asks these small businessmen to join him full time in kingdom work. Second, I've wondered why these guys didn't go home and talk about this life altering career move with their families. The gospel tells us they left their nets at once to follow Jesus. Don't you imagine there would have been some resistance at home? Can't you hear it? You're going to do what? Now? Well, that's just a huge risk. How do you know that that call is right and that it will change our lives for the better? Yes, Jesus began his ministry in this truly upside-down kingdom way that the prophets of old had forecasted. This Prince of Peace, incarnate God, came to us as very special seasoning to the world, a salty, peculiar person and deity who befriended and recruited all kinds of outsiders and outliers. This morning, I'd like to explore the way in which this drop your nets and follow me story encourages us to be receptive to the power of countercultural calls to service, that encourages us to embrace a life of salty, peculiar peoplehood, that encourages us to take innovative career risks that can yield life-enriching returns. But let us begin with looking at the typical calls to Christian service. The typical tracks for service to our church are two. First, people select a career early in service to the church and stay there. We have many trailblazers in the Mennonite Church who have left lasting legacies to the faith and to the world. One such distinguished servant of the church his entire life was Peter Dick. I was fortunate enough to hear him speak as a young teen in Kansas. He came to my church and shared his great story, how I tried to smuggle Bibles into the Soviet Union. It was an adventure, he said. He was a swashbuckling menno, if there ever was one. 
he was truly entertaining to us Kansas teens in the 70s. And I remember he said, go to a Mennonite school if you can. He said, I have tasted the flavor of almost all of them in Canada and the US at some point in my life. And in fact, he did earn degrees from Goshen College and the then Mennonite Biblical Seminary. From the time he was 12, escaping the communist revolution in Russia to his life and work in Canada, the United States, Paraguay, England, the Netherlands, Germany, and Russia, to his death at age 95 at MCC headquarters in Akron, Pennsylvania, Peter J. Dick committed his entire life to serving the Mennonite Church as a storyteller, a filmmaker, pastor, missionary, administrator, and ecumenical ambassador for peace. Born in Russia at the outset of the Great War, Peter almost died in the chaos of the Russian Revolution. At age six, he contracted typhoid and went hungry for years during the Russian famine. Peter and his family were finally rescued by food shipments sent from Mennonites in Canada and the United States, a kindness he said he would never, ever forget. By age 12, his family, including eight siblings, fled Russia, came to Canada, and settled in Saskatchewan. When World War II broke out, he was asked to serve with MCC in England, so he went. And there in England, he met Elfreda Claussen, a nurse who was also serving with MCC in England. She too was a Russian refugee who moved to Canada. They married in 1944. Once the war ended, the Dicks moved to the Netherlands to direct a massive MCC relief effort, unprecedented in scale for that country. In recognition of his superb leadership, Peter was knighted by Queen Juliana of the Netherlands. Then, beginning in 1956, the Dicks set up refugee camps in Germany for thousands of Mennonites who had fled the Soviet Union. For years, Peter and Alfreda led up to 5,500 Mennonites by boat to South America, mostly to Paraguay. Peter continued to crisscross North America until the age of 90. For his humanitarian efforts and international reputation in peacemaking, my newly adopted school, the University of Waterloo, granted him an honorary doctorate in 1974. What an extraordinary Mennonite minister and missionary on the world stage. May we continue to support Mennonite young people who, like Peter and Alfreda, pursue this career path to service. A second, even more typical track for service to our church is people volunteer to serve the church. Most MEDA members fit this category. Two businessmen profiled here at the media conference whom I know well, Harry Entz, CFO of Highline Mushroom in Leamington, and Rick Martin, general manager of Wallenstein Feed and Supply in Waterloo Region, are wonderful examples. They are business success stories, and they are also church success stories, because they have given generously of their time and their talent and their treasure to their church and to their church college. Some of you may be familiar with the book, Entrepreneurs in the Faith Community, Profiles of Mennonites in Business by Calvin Redekop. I'd like to share with you a thumbnail sketch of one of the earliest of the 12 successful Mennonite entrepreneurs profiled in that book, Jacob Schenck. By 1942, Mennonite Jacob Schenck was the most recognized businessman in the chicken hatchery industry in Virginia. Though he didn't graduate from high school until the age of 27, and took a big risk his senior year in pooling all of his modest resources with a bank loan to purchase a struggling hatchery, Schenck took only eight years to thrive as a businessman and to shine as an innovator. He had an uncanny ability to mix impeccable Christian ethics 
with stunning business success. Some of his innovations included building the first electric hatchery in the region and initiating profit sharing with his egg producing clients. Tragedy struck in 1950 at the very height of his business career. Returning from a church planting trip as a deacon for his church, the plane Shank was in crashed during a thunderstorm in Tennessee. He was just 50 when he died. The plane was just another one of his innovations. Jacob had trained to be a pilot in the mid-30s, and by 1936, he had bought an airplane. Despite the fact that his own Virginia Church Conference forbid the owning of airplanes. Jacob anticipated that the church would change its attitude about such things, and of course it did. But already years before his untimely death, Schenck became an innovator in philanthropy as well. At age 40, and increasingly I think that's really young, at age 40, with the blessing of his wife, Lucy, who served as secretary of the Shank Hatchery while raising four children, Jacob decided to dedicate 90% of his business profits to the church and its institutions. In 1949, the Shank Hatchery business posted revenues of $1 million. He said, we are stewards, not owners of our earnings. Over the course of nearly a decade, Schenck gave $500,000 to Eastern Mennonite College, the equivalent of well over $5 million in today's dollars. He channeled other sizable profits to local congregations, the Virginia Mission Board, and to the local hospital. May we continue to support Mennonite young people along this innovative career path, who, like Jacob Schenck, sustain our church with leadership gifts practiced in the larger public sphere of business and entrepreneurship, who are adept at living and succeeding at the highest levels in both worlds. These two career paths are well-worn paths, wide paths, and thankfully now more invitational paths to women and people of color. But are we missing paying attention to a third way of cultivating a countercultural track for encouraging successful Mennonites to drop their nets and return to serve the church and our church schools. Jesus' third way should have particular relevance to us as Mennonites. After all, our roots as a faith tradition are steeped in nonconformity. Conrad Grebel, the first Anabaptist ringleader, was born into wealth, pursued a life of influence purchased by his family's political connections, and was extremely well-educated. And yet, in the last 18 months of his life, what was he called to do? Not to run for office, not to teach at the prestigious state university. Grable was called to lead the radical wing of the Reformation, a movement committed to simplicity, and identification with the poor, a rejection of status politics, and a disavowal of a state church, and whose rank and file members were actually suspicious of formal education. And why do we need another path to church service? Well, our fishermen in the gospel notwithstanding, here are two other reasons. First, young people today don't like to be defined by tracks that don't have on and off ramps and intersecting loops. The Young Anabaptist Radicals website and the Young Voices column in the Canadian Mennonite are filled with commentary about this very issue. This yearning from our own young people squares with research from the recently concluded National Study of Youth and Religion. That research compiled in a fascinating book by Kenda Dean entitled Almost Christian what the faith of our teenagers is telling the church, tells us that young people today, the 4G crowd, overwhelmingly report that they want to live lives of purpose that intentionally connect success and service 
with spirituality, but they want to do that in innovative ways. Second, we need another path to career service in church because we are too small a denomination to rely on the traditional career paths to sustain and grow our church. Troy Watson of St. Catharines, Ontario, a Mennonite minister, may minister, made an impassioned plea in the Canadian Mennonite last year for how we must find new ways to call leaders to our church. The sustainability crisis our church is facing will not be solved by status quo mentalities. He writes, God continues to gift the church with innovators, but it is up to us to locate encourage and unleash our innovators. Troy continues, ask yourself or your church, are we inadvertently encouraging our most entrepreneurial young adults to pursue and stay in careers outside the church because there is not enough room for innovators to flourish inside the Mennonite church? Well, we do have third way stories from our faith tradition that need to be elevated. Let me share with you a few that I know about. Just a few weeks ago, Joji Padoja came to Conrad Grable to tell the unusual story of how she and her husband Dan left a comfortable Vancouver lifestyle for mission work in the Philippines. One day in 2005, Dan said he really felt called to his homeland in the Philippines. His faith journey is a remarkable story in itself. From communist sympathizer to conservative Baptist preacher to pacifist Mennonite pastor in Vancouver, British Columbia. As admirable as her husband's calling was, Joji said, I don't hear that call, Dan. You go. I'll stay here and continue to support you and our three children. You see, Josie was a highly successful financial planner in Vancouver. But after a year, despite comfortable financial security, Josie began to have second thoughts. She said, I began to have this frightening thought. If a summary of my life were printed on my tombstone, it would read, spent her life managing other people's money. I wanted to be remembered as a person who helped the poor through sustainable economic development. So I left my fancy suits and high heels for jeans and boots and committed myself to peace and reconciliation work with my husband in the Philippines. Another recent third way story. My fellow college classmate, Ron Headings, just last year stepped down from 25 years in senior management at Procter & Gamble to become vice president of marketing and enrollment at Bluffton College. A couple of weeks ago when I was in Ohio, I visited him. And of course, I asked him, why? Why, Ron, did you do this? He had been asked this so many times, he had a well-rehearsed answer for me. I know, why would I leave fame and fortune for this venture? Leave bustling Cincinnati for small town Bluffton? Well, it's quite simple. My focus as a marketing guru used to be, how do I sell more toilet paper? Now, it's how do I sell life-affirming educational choices for young people? My fulfillment level has skyrocketed. He also mentioned Bluffton was relentless in pursuing him, and he said, like you, Susan, I had a fantastic experience in our Mennonite schools and wanted to give back. Yes, my path to service at Conrad Grable is a little of this type. When Howard Good contacted me about speaking here today, he said to me, Susan, I think you have an interesting story to tell. Why did you leave Kansas? for Ontario? Why did you leave leadership at a large research university for a small Mennonite college? And how is it similar and different from your father's story? Telling one's own story is always tough, especially for Mennonites who 
pride themselves in humility. But here are a few episodes to my story that feed this third way approach to serving church. It begins with my father's story, Harold Schultz. My dad served as president of Bethel College, the oldest Mennonite college in North America, for 20 years, from 1971 to 1991. But what a journey from Canadian Baptist to U.S. Mennonite, from top research university life at Michigan, Duke, Oxford, and Stetson University in Florida, to Mennonite Liberal Arts College on the plains of Kansas. One reason I'm here today is my dad was granted special permission as a non-Mennonite at the time to enroll as a transfer student in grade 10 at Rockway Mennonite Collegiate in Kitchener, Ontario. The year was 1947. His dad, my grandfather, A.J. Schultz, was a well-known Baptist minister, a spell by Kitchener, Guelph, and New Hamburg, Ontario. And Reverend Schultz, was a pacifist who had served on the mission fields in Africa alongside Mennonites. Rockway granted the special admission that allowed my dad to attend this Mennonite high school. Well, my dad had a very persuasive best friend, Bill Clausen, who after he graduated from Rockway said, Schultze, you don't want to go to Waterloo Lutheran. Come to Goshen with me. And so, as fate would have it, my, my dad took a midnight train to check out this Goshen College in the States. There he met my mother, a good, smart Swiss menno from Holmes County, Ohio, who could play basketball, debate, and cook, and the rest is history. Another reason I'm here today goes back to 1970. We're living near Daytona Beach, Florida. I love it. I'm 10 who doesn't like going to the beach every weekend? My dad gets a call from a Bethel College search committee in Kansas. They ask him to become the next president of this college, a college in crisis. Al Meyer of Goshen and Bill Snyder of MCC had told the Bethel search committee, call Harold. My dad recalls this time as like playing Gideon in the Old Testament putting out the fleece. When my dad considered the invitation to leave Florida and his eminent career as a British historian, some anxiety arose in our family, to say the least. My dad got cold feet because the situation at this small Mennonite college on the prairies of Kansas was really serious. Sinking enrollments under 500, unbalanced budget, tension with churches that needed to be healed, and a Vietnam War that alienated town and gown relations. Why in the world would he leave his cushy digs in Florida for this? And further, my dad agonized, if he did come, what would he do with no resources to make needed changes? He had no interest in presiding over a money-strapped school. So he said, yes, I will come but with one condition, and this is the Gideon parallel. He said, I will come if the board raises $100,000, equivalent to well over $500,000 today, and they had to do it in three weeks. In later years, my dad said, maybe deep down, this was a way to provide an option of saying no, since how could they raise that amount of money in three weeks? As context, the total private gift income of the previous year at Bethel was only $120,000. But enter a visionary search committee that accepted the challenge. That committee, led by a medical doctor and a prominent businessman, surprised themselves and my dad. They did it, a remarkable feat. They raised the money, and it permitted immediate startup costs for three new departments my dad thought were essential, a business department, a social work department, and a nursing department, and the hiring of a full-time campus minister. And Bethel was on its way to recovery. Fast forward 40 years. My call from an innovative search committee came out of the blue in late fall of 2010. 
Only this Mennonite college was not in distress. Quite the contrary, it is very healthy. And this Mennonite college was not in Kansas or Indiana or Ohio, but in Canada. I can still hear my husband's refrain in those early weeks of processing the call with him. But Susan, it's Canada. <laughs> this persistent search committee was led by a persuasive attorney from right here in the Niagara area. When I expressed some incredulity, incredulity at the request to apply for the job, and flat out said to her, I don't even have a valid passport at this time. She said, well, that's not a problem. We're not interviewing for two months, and that will give you plenty of time to get one. <laughs> so why would I consider this call? I mean, by academic standards, I was successful and comfortable. I took pride in being well-published, recognized for distinguished teaching, was tenured and promoted, and serving in my eighth year as dean of a school of communication in the largest media market in the state. I took some satisfaction in being called what the Chronicle of Higher Education labeled in 2009 as precious outliers, that small group of women in academia who are married with more than two children, are serving as administrators and have found ways to become tenured and promoted in publish or perish research institutions in the United States. Why would I want to leave this comfortable world, especially give up a tenured faculty position with all its job security? But more important than all of that, my husband was successful. Why would he leave top management at the PBS television station, having just won Marketer of the Year, for no firm job prospects? When you add the concerns of my three children, and we'd be leaving one child behind in college, the logic balance sheet for some people might be no. But my yes answer is embedded in a much larger story that was part of my father's story. And I have been blessed with a superb education at Mennonite institutions where I met my talented and supportive husband. We both believe firmly in the power of faith-based education, that church colleges prepare students for a meaningful life, not just a successful career. I have also been enormously privileged to have so many mentors in my life, shoulder tappers, if you will, some gentle, others more firm, who have encouraged me over the years to get back to my Mennonite roots. And I've had wonderful experiences volunteering for my church as a Sunday school teacher and assuming conference committee leadership and then serving for seven years on Mennonite Education Agency of MCUSA, a committee I found composed of brilliant, generous, salt-of-the-earth people with significant responsibilities for finding school board appointments and nurturing presidential candidates in our Mennonite colleges, an agency that makes a real difference in providing leaders to strengthen the wider church. So you see, this call to serve Conrad Grable was compelling to me. Besides, this was not just any Mennonite college but a healthy, mission-centered college, a best-of-both-worlds academic arrangement. Because Grable is affiliated with Canada's most innovative university, the University of Waterloo, I could serve an Anabaptist-inspired liberal arts college and remain connected to a state-of-the-art research university. I accept the, the call to serve as president of Conrad Grable University College on March 8, 2011, International Women's Day. So it is my hope that we continue to lift up the stories of outliers who jump the track to lead a life directly connected to our Mennonite church, its agencies, and institutions. And as importantly, let's lift up the stories of mentors, groups, and committees, and search committees in the wider church who fly quietly under the radar 
and excavate in unusual places to shoulder tap these individuals. These inspirational search committees proved the outlier hypothesis advanced by Malcolm Gladwell, the celebrated staff writer of The New Yorker and best-selling author of The Tipping Point, Blink, and Outlier. Incidentally, Gladwell is a Canadian with family ties to the University of Waterloo and the Ontario Mennonite community. Gladwell writes in his book, Outliers, my wish with Outliers is that it makes us understand how much of a group project success is. When Outliers become Outliers, it is not just because of their own efforts. It's because of the contributions of lots of different people, and that means that we as a society have more control over who succeeds and how many of us succeeds than we think. That's an amazingly hopeful and uplifting idea. End of quote. Our church of tomorrow needs another Peter Dick, a Jacob Schenk. It also needs many, many more Joji Pendojas. It needs imaginative search committees that call people to serve in our church colleges and agencies. It is my hope that many more individuals in our faith community here and around the globe will hear a counterculture call to serve. And when those calls come, it is my hope that they continue to be answered with courage and conviction. Yes, yes, I will drop my safety net to serve my church, to take a path much less traveled by, but one that has made all the difference. Amen. <laughs>